How is it that we encounter such amazing beauty in nature? What processes are responsible for the inspiring scenes we enjoy? Come along with me and we will learn of the surprising and spectacular geology responsible for these colorful sandstones. Well, hello. I'm Myron Cook, and I'm in Nevada to warm up, came down south from Wyoming, and I want to share with you some beautiful and very interesting geology here in Nevada. I'm just south of Valley of Fire State Park near Mesquite, and I want to start right here with these beautiful sandstones that we're observing. With the beautiful coloring, but we have these sandstone beds that are dipping like this. And these are very distinctive of aeolian deposits, or wind-blown deposits. And as geologists map this region out, like me, I'm sure they were very confident in the nature of these deposits. And they were very confident that they could correlate it around. It turns out that this body of sandstone here in Nevada is called the Aztec sandstone. It's Jurassic age, about 180 million years or so and that it correlates, the very same sandstone correlates to the Navajo sandstone in Utah, which is so prominently exposed in Zions National Park, a beautiful area, of course. But it turns out there's a bit of a problem that makes me question as to whether I really know where I'm at in the stratigraphy or in the layers of rock. Which layer of rock am I observing? And there are reasons to start to wonder if I really know where I'm at. And I can imagine geologists back in the day when they were mapping this unit out in this area, they might have started to question themselves a little, even though it's so obvious. Now, why would that be? So to the confusion, yes, I'm confident in the sandstone. Yes, I'm confident that it's the Aztec or the Navajo. But am I? Because I've got a, th a problem that's kind of bothering me as I'm hiking around here mapping this. And that is this dark unit up on top, this dark gray, which is a dolomite. It just doesn't fit. I know all the layers, the stratigraphy we call from the oldest to the youngest. And the geologist that mapped out, her, out here certainly did. Hmm. Because I've not seen this on top of this sandstone before. So now I go, is this really the sandstone I think it is? That's a possibility. Maybe it's not the Aztec. I've got to sort that out. Of course, the other option is maybe that unit up there, that gray unit, is also a new unit that I haven't seen before, and I need to map it out. And it may not be that big of an area or something. So it's a bit confusing. Furthermore, just the nature of the contact between the dark gray and this beautiful sandstone just doesn't feel quite normal to me as a geologist. It just doesn't feel, it feels a little off. There's something about it that's different. Let's investigate that further. As I approached the contact, I came across this amazing color banding within the sandstone. Notice how it conforms to the fractures within it. Well, I finally made it up here to the contact. I'm a few feet above it for stability. I mean, it is a rocky, slippery mess at the contact. It's covered with all these little rocks all scattered along here, this debris. You can kind of see it, though, rising gently up in the distance. It's quite planar, and you, you can see the change in slope where you have the dolomite, the big, massive dolomite is dipping steeper, and then there's a change in slope. Now, about this dolomite, it's just a jumbled mess, this dark dolomite. It's really hard to see bedding in it. I did find a couple places right here where I'm at where I could, and it's dipping up steeper 
towards the sky than this gently dipping basal surface. So that's an interesting clue, isn't it? And this dolomite is really fractured. It is broken up at a finer scale as well. Let's think about these observations a bit more. The blue dashed line is along the contact, and I want you to focus your attention to the rock layers above this contact. The lighter colored layer is interesting. It comes down to the contact and disappears, and then reappears over here. If you look carefully, you will see folded and faulted or broken rocks all over above the contact. Let's look a bit closer at this area. It sure looks faulted and broken up. The red lines are just three faults I've highlighted, and there are many more. It's quite complicated. So how is it that we get folded rock and faulted rock and broken up rock on top of a planar surface like we've observed in the field, or on top of rock layers that are relatively horizontal or planar? I have a visual aid to help us in this matter, and that is a stack of printing paper. That's all it is, okay? I'm going to set it here. They're going to represent layers of rock, each sheet of paper. And I'm going to put a blue piece of paper on top here. Set it on top like this. And this blue paper represents a plane of weakness. So it's like shale. It's weak relative to the, all the other layers of rock. And that's important in this story. And then on top of this weak zone, we have other layers of rock. I'm just putting a couple sheets of paper. You know, it could be very thick, but this is for demonstration purposes here. Now, when we compress and we have forces that come in and squeeze everything, we can fold just the top layers that break free, that break along this plane of weakness. So I folded the rock here. And for that to happen, see, it breaks loose on this weak plane, this blue paper here, and, and we call this a detachment surface. And it's actually a fault because things have moved along it. This rock has moved along it to be able to fold and fault like this. And these observations that the geologists made out here, when they recognize this, whoa, let me tell you, then they know that something dramatic has happened in this region. Boy, am I having fun out here because I find things that just excite me as a geologist. Right behind me is this beautiful Aztec sandstone. And then as you come over, okay, with the sandstone right here, you come over and you start seeing this debris on top of it. Okay, this surface of this sandstone is coming down off the hill uh, from up here, okay, and coming down towards me. And it turns out that this is right at this contact. It's just that it's been eroded down right to almost to the surface of this sandstone. And we come over here. Let me show you something. This is what got me excited. Are these conglomerates. See that rock? It's made up of class of, of dolomite primarily. Stuck together. It's like cemented together. Here we see bedded or layered deposits of this conglomerate. And if we take a closer look, we can see various class sizes bound together by a nice calcite cement. And it's all over here, all along the top of this uh, Aztec sandstone are a lot of these conglomerates. And in the distance behind me, on the contact that you see on the hillside there, there are conglomerates underneath that, I'm told. Super cool, because these conglomerates have a very important story to tell us. One thing I love about geology is it's fairly easy to understand in some ways, because you can walk around in modern depositional environments and start to imagine how ancient rocks were formed. And I want to show you some conglomerates that are being made right now, right here on the ground. We see all kinds of pebbles and cobbles, just a lot of them, and they're being shed off the mountains in the distance. And so as these, all this debris, all these pebbles and everything shedding off the mountain, going out into the valley, the only thing that we don't have here is the cement holding all these pebbles together. I can come here. Yeah, 
they're loose. So to make this conglomerate, all we need to do is put it into the groundwater and have the groundwater that's mineral rich flowing through it and cementing, just like cement basically, in this case probably calcite, cement it together and it'll end up being a conglomerate like we saw earlier. You know, with this confusion about stratigraphy and why, what is this sitting on top and are we sure this is, is the Aztec sandstone underneath me? The thing that geologists do is they go back to a known, something that they're really confident in, where all the layers are laid out one after another very nicely and are not overly jumbled up and they think it through and they try to figure out exactly what this layer is and make sure that this below me, this beautiful Aeolian sandstone is the Aztec sandstone. This is the contact we've been examining at the north end of the Muddy Mountains. Out here is the Valley of Fire State Park. Geologists have been able to map the detachment surface all through the Muddy Mountains in this area. Now let's go to Frenchman Mountain just east of Las Vegas to see a nearly continuous section of the stratigraphic layers and formations. If you'll notice in the mountain behind me, all the rock seems to be pretty dark colored. And I brought you here because it's the older section of rock that has this very distinctive look. And they're primarily on the mountain here carbonates, meaning they're either limestone or dolomite. Looking along the side of Frenchman Mountain, we see that the rock formations are dipping very steeply at about 45 degrees. The dark carbonates that we're looking at sure remind me of what we saw above the contact in the Muddy Mountains. Let's review some of the basic stratigraphy, starting with the Great Unconformity along here. We have Cambrian 500 million year old rocks here, and as we move up through the formations, they become younger and younger. The rock layer at the crest of the mountain is Permian age and is about 255 million years old. Continuing on, we come to 240 million year old Triassic formations. Let's go down and take a look at these red rocks here. And we finally come to this Jurassic Age Aztec sandstone. And there's some complications right here in this immediate vicinity, but more or less it's a continuous sequence of rock to finally get here. Now that we have an understanding of the broad general uh, stratigraphy or the layers of rock that we have, we can start to think about, well, what's going on when we come to these anomalous situations that we are seeing out here in the Las Vegas Mesquite area. Now, I think it's likely that some of you are jumping ahead of me in this story, because now that we see the full sequence of stratigraphy, at least a large part of it, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, we've been seeing this dark colored dolomite on top of this Aztec sandstone. Could it be that that dark dolomite that we see, that darker color, is actually way down where we first started on Frenchman Mountain, not too far above the Great Unconformity, those dark colored carbonates, limestones, dolomites, mostly dolomites? And you know what, if you're thinking that, you are ahead of me. And now the question is, is how did that happen? What's going on? So we now know that we have 500 million year old rock sitting on top of 180 million year old rock, completely backwards from what you would expect. Let's continue with our geologic puzzle, should we? From a high altitude Google Earth view, we see the muddy mountains here, Frenchman Mountain here, Las Vegas, and then finally some 55 miles from the Muddy Mountains are the Spring Mountains. Looking closer at the Spring Mountains, we see some familiar patterns. The front of the mountains are dominated by the spectacular Aztec sandstone. And sitting right on top of the sandstone, along a sharp contact, are dark colored Cambrian carbonates. 
Let's take a closer look at the contact, which is a detachment surface similar to the one we saw in the Muddy Mountains. This is a beautiful place to see this contact. It's dipping gently down into the valley here, and we have this uh, creek uh, drainage that's cutting down into it, okay? And you can see the line over on the far side over here and back in the distance where you see the white color. In fact, that's what I wanted to point out here, is this is kind of new. We see the beautiful red sandstones over here on the right and then down in there we see sandstones that are bleached out so here's another piece of information for us to finally start to establish what actually has happened along this contact we know for sure that we have rock that's 500 million years old sitting on rock that's 180 million years old and there are only a couple ways to do that but to make this point really clear to you about the amazing part of this whole thing is if we were to take a drilling rig get to drill a hole up on top of this hill behind me we would drill through of course this gray dolomite of course we'd come down and hit this sandstone I'm standing on we'd keep going 5,000 feet 10,000 feet and pushing 15,000 feet below us you know what had happened we would hit this very same rock again, this old rock. It is some close to 15,000 feet under us right here. So there are two, it's stacked on top of itself, two layers of it. This reminds me of the scenario we had at Hart Mountain in my giant landslide video where we had old rock, where we have old rock, sitting on young rock. I want to point right up this little walk trail here. We're on the sandstone, right? Let's just hike right up here. We're hiking, by the way, right to the contact. Right to this contact. Here we go. I'm heading right to here. Hmm. What do we see here? Ah, our conglomerates. Yes. And there are more conglomerates above this, so there's probably a good 15, 10, 15 to 20 feet of conglomerate in here. Oh, this is really exciting to me. You're going to see why. It's getting late in the day, but I wanted to show you this because you see the spectacular alien sandstones of the Aztec over here. And then <laughs> swinging around over to the valley here, you see the big dolomites layers, huge mountain of the dolomites and other formations up through here with the contact running down along the valley. Really spectacular. Incredibly, we now know that this detachment surface is identified across a vast region from the Muddy Mountains to the Spring Mountains, a distance of some 50 miles. Now it's time to get down to business. That's the business of developing a model or a theory that explains our observations. We have two key things we need to explain, and that is the, the older rock on the younger rock, and also how this uh, sandstone gets such wild, beautiful coloring within it. It turns out there are really only two ways that you can get old rock on young rock. I have a sketch here of a, an uplift of a mountain, a big uplift. So this line here is a big fault with an arrow here showing that everything got uplifted. The red here with the check marks are the, are, are the old rock. It's the basement, the old rocks, okay? Some 1.7 billion years old in Nevada. And just in this sketch, let's just say this blue here and above this red, let's say that's Cambrian age, 500 some million years old or thereabouts. And then, of course, above that, we have younger rock. So we see that we have uplifted this old Cambrian rock way high up in the mountain, above the valley floor here. We'll say this is the valley floor. There has been significant erosion in this, in this model. 
has eroded much of it off the top. Now we can see that this is an unstable situation. We have steeply dipping layers of rock on the front of this mountain. And we could have a weak zone in here like a shale, a layer of shale or something. It could be pretty thin, actually. And it could just break free, just take loose, and it slides out onto the basin floor like that. So now what we have, of course, very old rock, Cambrian age rock, sitting on top of very young rock. So at a high level, this theory seems to work, doesn't it? We do know we have landslides like this. There's one not too different than this that occurred here in Wyoming. I've done a video on it where we had a ginormous landslide. But did it occur here? Do our observations fit this model? And you go, hmm, well, you know, I haven't seen mountains with old rock way up high. I do see mountains, like in Frenchman Mountain example, where I do see some old rock clear up to the surface, you know, up to the surface right down here next to the valley floor. But I don't see it up high. That would be one thing that would concern me. And also it, turn, it turns out that this conglomerate we've been observing is a clue. And it tells us actually, that I'll, and I'll get into it, that this is highly unlikely. And there are other things, the observations that geologists make, and eventually you come to the conclusion that, no, this model just doesn't work. It's not going to work here in Nevada. So what is it? Okay, so let's move on to theory number two. Now, uh, as we have plates and plate tectonics that move around and collide and things, they create tremendous forces and, and uplift mountains. In fact, the mountain in my prior sketch would have been uplifted due to some kind of plate tectonic movement, okay, or collision. But sometimes the rock, when it cl collides, when these pieces collide together, they don't uplift along steep reverse faults or steep faults like we saw in my prior sketch, but they break along lower angle faults called thrust faults. So these rocks can't handle the force. If my hands here are a layer of rock and you, and you really compress them, they can just break and slide on top of each other. I mean, that's it in the basic nutshell. So we compress it. These two big arrows show the compression force and we squeeze this and this can happen. Let me show you how they break along a fault. So the fault I want to show you is this second black line right here. So I have a lower black line, which is the top of basement right here. And I have a fault that breaks along a weak plane, a weak area of say shale, which is a detachment surface. Okay, it breaks and then at some point we call it cut across. They, it cuts up over across the rock formations and then it'll go flat again. So this black line, which is kind of hard to see, is the fault where everything slides and breaks. And it takes this layer of rock, the original layer here, over here was to reference that, breaks it and slides it out on top of itself. We refer to all the layers of rock that have moved above the fault or the detachment surface as a thrust sheet. Now, something that's really hard to get your head around is the, the scale of all this, because we know that this thrust sheet, uh, by mapping it out, you can't see it all. Pieces are eroded away and things, but it's about 50 miles wide or so. It could be even wider. And we know it slid out for some 50 miles on top of itself. Now, there could be multiple pieces of this. It's not necessarily one big, long unit. You know, it can break multiple times and complications, of course. All these rock formations that slid out on top, that's some 13,000 feet or so of rock that slid out on top of here. So you, man, that's a giant mountain, isn't it? Think about it. And there's so much weight, it compresses everything down. This didn't get 13,000 feet of elevation. It, it, we call it isostasy when it compresses. The, the earth sinks down when it gets all this weight. Plus erosion's occurring as it's going on as well. In the muddy mountain area, erosion has removed nearly all of the thrust sheet. At one time, it was some 13,000 feet thick. Incredible. This occurred about 180 million years ago during the, what we call the severe orogeny. But 
20 million years ago or so, everything got kind of pulled apart, so it complicates it. The Basin and Range, which is a fascinating story in itself, where it just kind of reversed. It just went from all this compression to extension and, and cut all this up, you know, faults and whatnot and rotated blocks. And that's how the mountains like Frenchman Mountain, for instance, and most of them in the Basin and Range occur because of this pulling apart combination of the two. Wow, that's a whole nother story. I don't want to get into that right now. So I want to use this sketch to talk about the conglomerates too, because boy, they're impressive. In my mind, they're so neat because they're telling me a story. And that is, as this mountain came up over, I call it a mountain. Well, you create this high area here, you're eroding material off of here out in front. So what happens is out in front, you're shedding off uh, debris, we'll call it, conglomerates that come out here and then this thrust sheet as it continues to move forward, if it does, will go right on top of it. Right on top of the conglomerates that are being deposited by little streams and stuff or alluvial fans out in front of this mountain, just like we see in front of the modern mountains, huh? And these conglomerates tell me that it's not catastrophic. Because I see conglomerates back under here, right on top of the contact. So that tells me, you know, that this occurred over a long period of time. You might ask, well, how fast? Well, plates move on their faster end about, oh, four inches a year or so. That's about twice as fast as your uh, fingernails grow. And so these, this plate, in theory, could be as it slides out on top, could be moving at those kinds of speeds. Seems pretty slow, but in geologic time, that's moving right along. And finally, we want to talk about the Aztec sandstone and the beauty, and how does it tie into this? I mean, this is super amazing, and it ties into such beauty, such interesting patterns and colors and things. The same processes are responsible for the beauty found in Valley of Fire State Park. So, this fault is sitting right on top of Aztec sandstone. Now imagine all the all this weight and the thrust sheet and the pressures and all this. Well, what does it do? It breaks up the rock. It fractures it up. I'll put fractures all through here that go down into the rock, okay? I should make these lines a little more straight. Fractures tend to be kind of straight in general, okay? It fractures the rock up. I mentioned it loads it with all this weight and everything kind of compresses and sinks down and presses down. And you have all these fluids, uh, groundwaters and things that are moving along these fractures. And it's highly fract, very highly fractured up next to the, to the actual surface. The contact we've been talking about, which is the fault. It's actually the fault. And it gets more intense there, and you get these fluids that bleach the rock out. They have a reducing property. So when these sandstones, the Aztec sandstones, were deposited, they had the nice red colors. They may not have been super intense, but in general, red colors, okay? And they can be intensified, or they can be depleted depending on groundwaters and things. So when we see the light colors that we have, those are reducing fluids. It reduces the oxidized iron, that's the reddish color, and it reduces it. Uh, a chemical reaction reduces it and changes the colors. And we notice that the colors often change right along the fractures. And thanks to all this amazing geology history here, everything combined comes together to give us such amazing, interesting patterns and beauty. I love it. I want to thank my nieces Vi, Opal, and Nora for going out and helping me. And I want to thank all of you for watching.